reading to verse 21. But before we do, I want to tell you about uh, Matt and Dawn. I told him I was going to get him this morning. <laughs> so, um, one day, uh, I guess from work, uh, Matt had to uh, take a lady home. And um, although it was an, a completely innocent uh, gesture, uh, he decided not to mention it uh, to Dawn. He didn't want her to get jealous or think anything of it. So uh, he took the lady home from, from work. And uh, anyway, later that night, uh, Matt and Dawn decided to go out uh, for, for dinner at a restaurant. And while they were driving to the restaurant, he, Matt looked down and he spotted a uh, high heel shoe underneath, <laughs> right there at the corner of uh, the passenger seat there where Dawn was. And not wanting to look suspicious or anything, uh, Matt waited until Dawn was looking out the window there, and he scooped that shoe up and tossed it out the window. <laughs> and uh, with a sigh of relief, he was thinking, you know, I don't have to think about that. They pulled into the restaurant and. Then he noticed Dawn was over there kind of squirming around a little bit, and she said, uh, Matt, have you seen my other shoe? <laughs> and I'll let him tell you the rest of the story. <laughs> Genesis chapter 2, beginning with verse 21, and we'll read through. Verse uh, 25. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. You bow in prayer with me, please. Father in heaven, we now ask for your anointing, for your filling of the Spirit, Lord, as we bring this message this morning. Lord, might these words be your words and not my words. And Lord, I pray for especially each couple that's here this morning, Lord, uh, that, uh, that we would be enriched, Lord, and that we would see uh, from the Scriptures uh, what a marriage is intended to be like in the Christian family. Lord, and help us, O oh Lord, uh, to apply this to our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Two women were talking uh, during lunch uh, the other day, and one lady had had a very hard time trying to find a husband, a, a male friend, and she got so desperate that uh, she decided to put an ad in the newspaper. And the other lady asked her, she said, well, have you had any luck, any responses in trying to find a husband? And uh, she replied, oh, yes, I got 200 people who said you can have mine. <laughs> people want to be loved. And they want to feel loved. And we want to feel like folks care about us. That someone is concerned about our well-being how our day went today, and so forth. And I went surfing the internet, looking for some of those uh, love tests, I guess you could say. You probably remember in elementary school sometimes when folks would pass those notes around and uh, uh, the notes would say something like, do you like me, check yes or no, or, or do you want to go out with me? No, good about well, elementary school, you weren't going anywhere, but you would put that, you want to go out with me. And... Uh, Anyway, I saw on the internet some questions that I guess some of the, the younger folks were asking, like, uh, are you crushing on him, or do you have true feelings for her? And uh, another couple of questions says, it hurts when I don't see him or her for a long time, or, or if she were checking out another guy, I would blank, whatever. There are even some of those love tests for adults as well, and some of those questions were, and of course you fill in these blanks with your spouse, I share deep personal information about myself with blank, or I find myself thinking about blank during the day, or I cannot imagine another person making me as happy as blank does, whoever it is. Well, today we're going to examine relationships, specifically marriage, the way that God intended for it to be. And people use all sorts of resources for advice on marriage, trying to find true love. 
But let me say that God created marriage. And there is no better instruction manual for a successful marriage than the Holy Bible, this book that I hold in my hands. So if you want some advice about marriage, you go to this book right here, the good book. Some try to use television and society for how a marriage should work. And do you know, if we were to use television for marriage, what would we find? What would we see? Well, desperate housewives would teach us that marriage is not permanent. Will and grace would teach us that marriage is not confined to one man and one woman. And friends would show us that sexual relationships outside of marriage are acceptable. Now, some of those may be some of your favorite shows. I don't know. But the message that they send is contrary to the message that the Bible gives us about marriage. And I'll say it again. God created marriage. And there is no better instruction manual for marriage than the Bible. You can like it or not. You can accept it or not. You can embrace it or not. But this is and should be the standard in our homes, the Bible. Now, before we look at our text for this morning, I want us to look at the preceding verse for just a moment. God, the verses, God has created Adam, the very first man on planet earth. And verse 15 says that God put Adam in the garden of Eden to take care of him. And in verse 19, God creates the animals and he sends them to Adam so that Adam could name them. So right off hand, let me correct what some of you are taught in school today. The first human being was not some unintelligent caveman that just grunted sounds out of his mouth. No, Adam was an intelligent man, and he could speak a language. And this naming of animals should have caused Adam to see that he was the dominant part of creation. You see, he didn't go to the animals. The animals came to him. God sent them all to go to Adam. And then in verse 1, he starts naming them. You know, they're coming back. <coughs> Mr. and Mrs. Hippopotamus. Mr. and Mrs. Giraffe. Mr. and Mrs. Elephant. Maybe Mr. and Mrs. Sparrow as it flies by. There's a parade of animals coming by. And Adam is naming them as they come through. Picture it in your mind for just a moment. These animals coming. Mr. and Mrs. Pig. Mr. and Mrs. Chicken. Adam must have noticed that everyone had a counterpart. Except for him. Except for him. Now listen carefully for just a moment. Adam could have gone searching. Climbing the trees. Beating the bushes. Maybe going through the waters looking for somebody. But the closest he would have been would have been an orangutan or a chimpanzee. Not his match. Today, men and women get anxious. And they become anxious whenever they're single. And they say, I've got to find somebody. I need somebody. So they get, go off and they come back with, a, with an orangutan or an ape. Not the match that God intended for them. So many rush into a relationship with the wrong person and not considering God's timing, they make a mess of things. Now, now, don't get me wrong. God could show you your match within a month's time or it might take five years. But what I'm saying is make sure that the person that you're with is God's match for you. That is God's match for you. And that brings us to our text for today. In verses 21 and 22, God performs surgery on Adam. He puts Adam to sleep and then he took one of his ribs and made a woman, the Bible says, and he brought her to Adam. Proverbs 18 verse 22 says, Whoso findeth a wife, findeth a good thing, and obtain a favor of the Lord. And let me pause right there for just a minute. Men, if you have, if God has brought to you a wife, if you have found a wife, if you have a wife this morning, you thank God for her. You love her. You support her. You nurture her. You trust her. You treasure her. You cherish her. And men, if you have a woman, you remember that the first woman was not taken from Adam's head to dominate him. Not from his feet to be trodden down, but from under his arm to be protected and from near his heart to be loved, to be loved. I wonder this morning, men, do you love and cherish the woman in your life? Ladies, do you thank God for that man in your life? And I want you to notice a few more things about verses 21 and 22 before we move on. Notice that God did not create wives, but a wife for Adam. And I've said it many times and I'll say it again. 
God's design for marriage is for one man, one woman, for love. For love. Not two men together. Not two women together. Not one man and four wives living together in a polygamous lifestyle. And you can argue with me about how culture and society has changed all you want. But you either choose to accept God's Word or you don't. Like it or not, His Word does not change and it will not change. One man, one woman, that's marriage in God's eyes. And what does this mean for everyday life for you and me? Well, this means that when you get married, you give up some of those close relationships with the fellows or the girls. And you might say, well, are you saying that I never get to, get to see my good friends again? No, that's not what I'm saying. Here's what I am saying. If you are serious about being in a relationship, as in a marriage, then you give up your freedom to go with your friends when you choose. The husband or the wife is now first priority in your life when it comes to the human relationships. And I'll say that again. In a marriage, the husband or the wife is the first priority. Not your friends, not even your children. The husband and the wife is the primary relationship that God has established. And we'll see that in just a moment. You say, well, I can't handle that. I like to go with the girls three or four times a week and, I, and the fellow might say, I like to go out with the fellows a lot. Well, if a person cannot handle it, having their husband or their wife as their first priority, then they are not yet mature enough for the demands of a marriage. Parents, you make sure that you teach your children this important biblical truth. So, you know, a lot of times I'll see married men or women out here and there all over the place and the spouse and the children are at home. That's not what God has intended for the Christian family. And there's another important biblical truth for us in these verses. How many wives here, you don't have to raise your hand, especially if your mother-in-law happens to be here today. How many wives here have ever had a problem with their mother-in-law? The mother-in-law uh, to be wants to help plan the wedding, you know. Sometimes she wants to force what she wants in the wedding. And sometimes she may try to tell the wife how to raise uh, the children. And, and your mama's boy husband just keeps running to her all the time. How many husbands here? You don't have to raise your hand if your father-in-law is here, but how many husbands have experienced some tension with their father-in-law? And you know, men, we sometimes get irritated when our wife, uh, we, they call their daddy instead of us to ask them something or, or, or if they need something at some point. I know some of you men have had that happen before. Listen now, especially if you live near your spouse's family. Marriage is the primary relationship. We said that earlier in verse 18 is God said it is not good that man should be alone. So when God said it wasn't good for Adam to be alone, who did He create for Adam? Think about that for just a moment. What kind of a person as far as the relationship is concerned did He give to Adam? Did He create a daddy for Adam when Adam was alone to keep him company? No. Did God create Adam a mommy when He said that it wasn't good for Adam to be alone? No. When God declared of His creation it is not good for man to be alone, did He give Adam a little son or daughter to run around with Him? No. God gave Adam a wife. Why is this important? This signifies to you and to me this morning that the most important human relationship is the husband and the wife. Those two are the most important human relationship. And we certainly do not abandon our parents. Do not get me wrong about that. But a person must have enough emotional security to break away from dependence upon their parents. And I've seen many uh, individuals, especially those that live near their parents, they run back and forth to their parents every day. The husband feels left out or the wife feels left out whenever that happens. You must break away dependence from your parents. There are so many arguments in marriages because the husband does not know how to tell his mother to back up. It causes so much strain for the wife to have her mother-in-law to be too involved in the decision-making that should be her own. Husbands, I know your mother is special to you this morning. I know that. But make sure that your wife also knows that you love her and that she is special as well. Where is uh, Jason Gleaton? I know he's... Yeah, there he is on the back. <laughs> I don't know if y'all knew this, but we, we already knew that uh, Steve Jowers was a, a poem writer. He, he read a poem last night, and uh, he said that he would sell them next to Valentine's for about $35 a piece, I believe. Well, Jason shared one of his poems with me that he gave to uh, Nikki, and I don't think y'all are going to want to uh, 
want to give one of Jason's poems, so <laughs> let, let me read it to you out of what it said. Um, and I kind of question some of the comparisons he made uh, with Nikki and, and some of these items. He said, Nikki, you're like asthma. You take my breath away. <laughs> Nikki, you're like dandruff. I can't get you off my head. <laughs> you're like my truck. You drive me crazy. You're like dentures. I can't smile without you. <laughs> so if, if you want problems in your marriage, see Tasty together. <laughs> I do want to speak up for the fellas for just a minute too. There are disagreements as well when the daughter continues to call on her daddy instead of telling him to keep out sometimes. And wives, I know you love your daddy and you respect his opinion, but make sure you love and respect your husband's opinion as well. Now parents, we need to raise our children with that view of releasing them so that they can leave us and cleave to their own husband or wife in due time. Love and raise your children in the admonition of the Lord while they're still in the home, realizing that one day they will be on their own. And sometimes couples build their marriages around their children, and this is a big mistake because disaster is ahead when that nest empties and all the children are gone. The, the two parents end up having to, to learn one another again in a lot of those cases. And I'm no marriage expert, but I realize it is vital for Joy and I to get together and get away sometimes alone. If you are a couple with children in your home today, I highly encourage you to get away sometimes, just you and you and your spouse uh, without the children, because marriage, again, is the most important human relationship if God has called you to be married. Now I want us to look at something else. I tried, and, and, and you'll have to kind of excuse my drawing there. I did the best I could. Marriage triangle. The marriage triangle. I wonder this morning, as you think about your marriage, those of you that are married, or those of you that are in a relationship, honestly, between you and the Lord, how would you rate how satisfied you are with your marriage on a scale of 1 to 10? 10 being very satisfied, 1 being very unsatisfied. How would you rate the overall relationship with your spouse this morning? As far as communication is concerned, do you communicate well with one another? And communication is not always easy to do. You know, Joy and I don't always communicate the way that we should. Uh, Joy and I had words uh, the other night, you know. Well, I had words, uh, she had paragraphs the other night. <laughs> I didn't get to say a whole lot. But anyway, how is communication in your home today? How is communication? How about with uh, spending money? Money is a key issue with a lot of uh, couples, uh, and it, it causes a lot of disagreements on how to spend money. I heard about a man named Bert and Marge, and they've been married for like 60 years, uh, and they still held hands. In fact, he gripped their hand tight whenever he saw them in the store, you know, and walking around, and someone asked Bert about it, and they, he, they said, uh, why do you hold hands all the time when you go out? He said, well... When I let go, she takes off and goes shopping, spending money. So I'm going to go. <laughs> I wonder this morning, is there distance in your relationship? Is there? Is there too much fighting in your home? Would you like to have a more fulfilling marriage or relationship? If so, I have a secret to share with you this morning. It takes three to be in a successful marriage. It takes three. Is it husband, wife, and husband's mother? No. Is it husband, wife, and wife's father? No. It is husband, wife, and God. Husband, wife, and God. Those are the three that it takes to have a successful marriage. And I'm going to come down here to this drawing for just a second. And I tried to sketch it on some of those handouts too in case you couldn't see up here. But we have three in the marriage triangle. A husband, wife, and and God at the top. This green dash line here represents the distance between the husband and the wife. Now, I want you to notice something. So we've got God, husband, wife. And I'm just going to illustrate it with my fist for just a second. As a husband gets closer to God, as a wife gets closer to God, I want you to notice 
the difference in the distance between my hands this morning as they get close to God. Do you see what happens in a triangle like that? Where both the husband and wife are getting closer to God? What happens there with the distance between my fists? What happens? Anybody? They get closer. That's exactly right. So, that's what happens in a marriage. When the husband and wife are seeking God, they can't help but to get closer to God. That's the way it works. But so many couples leave God out of it, you see. And so, they, they end up staying this far apart. But when, you, when God is in the equation, and in that triangle, you can't help but to get closer to one another. And, and, and I stand on God's Word for that. Whenever you seek the Lord in a successful marriage, you must have God in it. You must. You must. The father that one moves away from God, then the father the husband and wife moves away from one another. And I'm going to make a strong statement this morning, and I know we've got a variety of different couples here. There may be some couples who are thinking about marriage. There may be some couples that were recently married. There may be some couples that have been married for 30 years. I don't know, like Renee and Jen. But I'm going to make a strong statement. Broken marriages always, I'll repeat that, always involve at least one partner moving away from God. They do. So if you want your marriage to improve this morning, here's what you have to do. Both partners must seek God, and then your marriage will improve. Your, men, your aim this morning should be to seek God. Women, your aim this morning should be to seek God. What's going to happen then? You're going to get closer to one another. If you desire more closeness in your marriage, then you must get closer to God as individuals as well. And you say, well, how do I get closer to God? We get closer to God by reading His Word. We get closer to God by praying. We get closer to God by coming together with other believers. The God triangle is the secret to a successful marriage. And if God is not in your relationship, then uh, folks, you're going to be this far apart until the day you die. But if you will start seeking God, automatically what's going to happen is you're going to get closer to one another. You will. Now in conclusion, uh, this morning, you know whether your marriage is what it should be. Whether it is fulfilling or whether it is lacking. Dear wife, is your husband your first priority other than the Lord in your life? Husband, is your wife first priority in your marriage, even above those buddies of yours? The Bible says that a man shall leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. I wonder this morning, are your parents too involved in your marriage? Are you and your wife one flesh today? As you look at that triangle, think about your marriage this morning. Are you getting closer to God? Are you and your spouse arguing this week perhaps? This triangle says if you and your spouse are arguing this week and aren't getting along, that one of you is not going after God. One of you is not seeking after God. One of you may be going the other direction. So if there's friction in your home this morning, if there's strife in your home this morning, then one of you is not seeking God. Divorce, and I'll say this again, divorce, separation, marital problems are always, 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 always the result of at least one partner moving away from God. If things are not right this morning with your marriage, I wonder which one of you needs to get right with God. Husband, wife, both of you maybe. Marriage is ordained by God, and it is not to be taken lightly. Examine your marriage. Where are you on this triangle today? Or if you're in a relationship even, are you at the bottom, but maybe moving in the right direction? Are you somewhere in the middle, but not really moving anywhere at all? I wonder where your spouse is today. God intends for there to be joy in your marriage, not a lot of fussing and fighting and so forth. Now as we prepare for the invitation. I'm going to ask you to come this morning. Maybe you're sitting there this morning and you're not a Christian. And you know it. If you die right now, you know that you would not go to heaven. You can come and receive Jesus Christ as your own personal Lord and Savior today. The Bible paints a beautiful picture of marriage. Jesus is our groom. And we are all the bride of Christ as, as His church. Saved believers are the bride of Christ. And He's coming again to receive us unto Himself.
And you can come this morning and say, well, I don't know what to do. I want to receive Jesus Christ. I want to be a Christian, but I just don't know what to do. What am I supposed to do? <coughs> you can come and, and take me by the hand in just a few minutes when we begin our invitation song. And you can come and say, I want to receive Christ as my Savior and have forgiveness of my sins. And you can do that and you can be saved right now. And you'll be saved till, uh, well, you'll be saved forever. Maybe you and your spouse, maybe you're sitting there this morning and you and your spouse would come rededicating your marriage. There's no better time than Valentine's when we're celebrating love to, to do so, to recommit to love one another as one flesh. Perhaps couples all over the sanctuary would get up in a few minutes and come and grab me by the hand and say, you know, uh, I want us to be one flesh. I want us to grow and and, and seek the Lord. And then you can go back and then have a seat. It can be as simple as that. And by coming forward, you're, you're uh, showing folks that you mean business, but you're also before the Lord making that commitment right there. Do you want love and harmony in your marriage, in your relationship? You seek God. You become one flesh. And I'm going to ask you in just a moment to come if the Lord has spoken to you today. And we'll be baptizing in just a few minutes. So would you bow in prayer with me, please? Father in heaven, we thank you for all your blessings, Lord. We realize that you are so good to us each and every day. And Father, I pray for that man, that woman, that teenager, that boy or girl that's here this morning, that has never trusted Jesus as their Savior. Lord, I know this wasn't a message necessarily aimed at salvation, Lord, but we don't know how your Spirit may be working today. So Lord, I pray that you would help that one to come, Lord, and receive Christ as their Savior. And Lord, I pray for that couple this morning. That couple where things have not been the way they should be. Things have been right. Help that couple to come. Lord, perhaps there's one that's in, in a marriage that's here today and, and the marriage isn't what it's supposed to be, Lord, and he or she knows it and, and their spouse isn't even with them today. Help that one to come praying for their spouse, Lord, that they would seek the Lord, desiring a, a stronger relationship with you and with each other. Lord, with whatever decisions that need to be made today, oh Holy Spirit, I pray that you help us to make them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks, uh, Morris. <laughs> Thanks, Morris. Thanks, Morris. Thanks, Morris. Thanks, Morris. It is a little bit cool in here. <laughs> James, do you believe that Jesus died on the cross for your sins? Yes, sir. Are you trusting Him now as your own personal Lord and Savior? Yes, sir. Upon your profession of faith, by the divine command of Christ Jesus our Lord, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.
Are you trusting him now as your own personal Lord and Savior? Upon your profession of faith, by the divine command of Christ Jesus our Lord, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.